Good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, taking time out of your busy schedules, and especially on uh, a week like this with uh, so many events and meetings, uh, uh, all of which uh, address many of the issues we all care about and are interested in for taking the time to join us this morning uh, for this launch uh, and this discussion. Uh, in particular, thank you to Sexton's Ambassador Malagu, uh, uh, Ambassador of the Republic of South Africa, for joining us uh, this morning for this discussion. Uh, we had a wonderful conversation the other day with uh, uh, the Central Bank, uh, the Reserve Bank Governor of South Africa here. Uh, those of you who missed it, uh, it's available, uh, the video is available on our website. My name is Peter Fahm. I'm a Vice President here at the Atlantic Council and Director of the Africa Center. It's really a pleasure to welcome you to this event on the impact of disruptive technologies in Africa. Uh, we're launching uh, at this event two of our latest reports, uh, one on fintech powering inclusive growth in Africa and one on 3D printing shaping Africa's future, both written by our senior fellow, Dr. Alexandra Gonzala. Um, unfortunately, Alexandra couldn't join us today. She suffered an injury earlier this week which prevented her from flying. Uh, and traveling to Washington, so we wish her a speedy recovery. Since the Africa Center was founded in 2009, our mission has been to promote dynamic geopolitical partnerships with African states and to try to help shape U.S. and European policy priorities to strengthen economic growth and prosperity on the African continent. It's that second element, strengthening economic growth and prosperity, on which our papers that were uh, launching focus. Africa, as we all know, is the home to six of the 10 fastest growing global economies. The continent's rapidly growing tech and innovation hubs have contributed significantly to this growth, and yet the continent also faces many challenges, just especially those which come from the widespread adoption and management of disruptive technologies, including financial technology, fintech, and 3D printing. The two publications we're launching today argue that with the right policies and enabling environments in place, African countries can not only survive these disruptions, but might be also possible to leverage these new technologies to their economic advantage. Before I turn it over to the Africa Center's senior fellow, Aubrey Ruby, who will introduce our panelists and moderate today's discussion, I'd like to thank the OCP Foundation for their generous support for our economic prosperity programming through our partnership with the OCP Policy Center. It's thanks to their commitment to the Africa Center that we're able to do such timely work on some of the critical economic questions facing Africa today, and we're very grateful for their continued friendship. With that, I'll hand the mic over to Aubrey, who introduced today's panel and set the stage for the discussion. So it's all yours, Aubrey. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Baum. Is my mic on? Okay, you can hear me. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fum, for that uh, kind introduction and, and mentioning our two reports. Uh, you, can, you guys can pick them up outside. Um, I will say a couple words uh, about them. I think the FinTech report gives a good overview of different developments that are going on around the continent vis-a-vis -vis, uh, mobile payments, blockchain, blockchain um, some cryptocurrencies and you'll get a good sense of kind of the current status of the industry, though some new data has been released since we've even published this, so um, we need to update. And then uh, 3D printing uh, is, gives an interesting perspective on the discussion around African markets today, but looks at comparative markets, so India, uh, Cambodia. Uh, it does uh, do a special spotlight on South Africa's leadership in, um, in 3D printing and, and robotics efforts. So I'm glad the uh, Honorable Ambassador could join us today because 3D printing is uh, a leadership area for, for South Africa. Well, I'm pleased to be joined on this panel today by uh, esteemed experts and practitioners in the space, both investors and entrepreneurs, uh, for a conversation of these two technologies and where we can expect uh, new disruptions. Uh, to my left is Wale Yene from the IFC, who heads up the African venture efforts, so making venture investments based in Lagos. We have Tihar Dasani with the um, fund here in DC that is 
focused on fintech investments, but globally, Africa is a big portion of that, so that's Axion. And then we have uh, Chijoke uh, Dozier, who's with OneFi, a specialized credit platform, but a longtime entrepreneur, a serial entrepreneur and investor um, uh, based out of Lagos. And then Injadeka Harry, who is the president of the uh, Youth for Technology Foundation and has a lot of experience in the areas of STEM education, 3D manufacturing, and robotics. So we're gonna jump into the conversation here. Um, I think one way to, to think about the context is some of the new findings of uh, the Findex report show that while financial inclusion is increasing uh, globally, uh, it is also increasing in African markets, uh, but we can't ignore the role of traditional banks in that effort. Uh, so, Tahira, I'd love to kind of turn to you and give a sense of where you think uh, financial inclusion in fintech is currently and what new trends are interesting to you and based on some of this new data. Thanks, Aubrey. So, you know, I think the results from the FinDex are really encouraging and it's fantastic to see that financial inclusion is increasing, that the number of individuals, low income individuals in particular, that have access to an account is increasing and access to credit in particular is increasing globally, uh, there's still a long way to go. And while banks do have a role and will continue to have a role in driving financial inclusion, banks are not necessarily best positioned to leverage some of the new technologies that we're going to be talking about today. Um, banks are large bureaucratic institutions, they have legacy technology and systems, and they are often risk averse. They don't have the ability to target niche segments uh, as easily as startups can. And that's why at Axion Venture Lab, we support fintech startups because we really see them as drivers of innovation in financial inclusion. And we think that innovation is critical to really expand financial inclusion because that innovation is what's able to bring the cost to serve low-income consumers down to a point where it is profitable to serve them. And so that you actually are able to bring them into the formal systems. So we're excited about a number of technologies. I mean, you know, absolutely, fintech is a broad term. And so within that, um, we're particularly excited by some of the growth in insure tech and the use of, uh, of AI, of machine learning, to support better underwriting, both in the credit space and the insurance space. We're really excited about some of the innovations that we're seeing in the ag sector, and those are particularly relevant in Africa. Um, you know, we think that blockchain Can is still nascent. Can you give us nascent. an example of fintech and ag that you're liking? Sure, there's a, a recent investment that we just did actually is in a company, or two, two I'll mention. One is a company called Apollo Agriculture, uh, based in Kenya, but they use um, basically satellite imagery, remote sensing data, as one of the many inputs that they use when they're underwriting farmers. Uh, because these are farmers who you know, don't have access to formal financial systems. And so in addition to an agent network that they have to go out and acquire these farmers to lend to them, they're also able to use a whole host of new technologies to get more data to enable better underwriting. Or a company like Pula, which provides agriculture to smallholder farmers across Africa, both East and West Africa. And they are also able to use satellite data, remote sensing data, weather pattern data, et cetera, to better underwrite these farmers. And so that's really critical as we look at expanding financial inclusion beyond urban areas, et cetera. So, uh, Wale, I'll turn to you also as an investor. What, what kind of technologies and companies are interesting to you? Where do you see the market over-invested in some and under-invested in others? Uh, as an investor, you're supposed to be the contrarian out there picking the uh, winners that no one else sees. So, uh, Dan, Thanks for having me here. Uh, kind of on the IFC and the VC group, we look at tech and tech-enabled opportunities globally, uh, but in Africa especially. We focus on a few key areas, which is fintech, uh, clean tech, education tech, and consumer internet broadly. Um, what we, we, we very much opportunistic, so we like to see people that have significant <coughs> product market fit and how people are applying technology to actually reach the mass market. Because when you look at Africa, like uh, about a lot of people, at least the PE firms, try to target the emerging middle class. But for the VC group, because we're looking for like outsized large scale growth, we need to target mass market opportunities. So when you're targeting mass market opportunities, sometimes it's not so much about the disruption, 
but more about how does the disruption get distributed downstream and how do people start to partake of that disruption. So it's quite easy to say, okay, you have a blockchain or uh, 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 AI or ML and all these acronyms that we hear, but for us it's more important, is, uh, it's more important how are you applying that and are people deriving value at the bottom of the food chain to actually from that technology? So, so that's it's not just how the technology, it's, it's not the, the technology. marketing. It's the marketing <laughs> and actually the adoption from the mass market that we try to f focus on. Like we see a lot of things in ag tech as well, which is kind of surprising, but, but there's a lot of people using technology to reach farmers and actually increase crop yield. So with this, things like Twigger Food, Farm Align, mm -hmm. Farm Crowding, a bunch of people have figured out that uh, for the mass market, food is important. And there's a lot of ways you can use technology to actually increase yield on that. So we, we, we spent a lot of time in that sector, but I can keep talking all day, but, <laughs> but, but I'll stop and give people other uh, chance. Sh okay. Sure. So on the, on the technology side, um, maybe in Jadeka, we could go to you and hear a little <coughs> bit about what you think are emerging technologies uh, and their application on the continent. Because to date, we haven't heard about big investments in 3D printing operations or uh, robotics or Internet of Things per, per se out of Africa. It's more discussion of whether the impact of those technologies uh, being deployed in the United States and in Europe and developed markets, what's going to be the impact on Africa, but it's not been dialogued about the companies operating in that space in Africa. So we'd love to hear a little bit of your thoughts. Absolutely. Thank you, Aubrey, um, for that quick introduction. And if I can just quickly piggyback sure. on Wally's last comment regarding um, the technologies, uh, you know, when you look at technology, really, um, technology in itself is not not an end, right? It's a means to an end. And so really starting with the problems that exist in these local communities and then figuring out, working, of course, with the communities, is there te a technology, a type of technology that solves that problem? I think oftentimes we're in a hurry to throw those acronyms around and, um, you know, start with the technology as opposed to starting with the people, which is a really a dynamic um, a dynamism that we need to change. But with that, um, 3D printing technologies, as many of us know, are, are accelerating and disruptive technologies. And when you think of um, these disruptive technologies, they're technologies that, of course, are, are accelerating very quickly. They're transformative and they have um, the ability to really move um, cost pools from the producers to the consumers. And then they have a, a, an economic transformation on millions of people, hundreds and millions of people across a variety of industries and sectors. And um, we see 3D printing as, as one of such technologies in its applicability um, on the continent for a variety of reasons. One um, of which we know is where the manufacturing industry is right now in, in, in Africa and in the countries that exist in Africa. And there is a potential to have um, individuals and companies in Africa that are using this technology to actually create prototyping products um, on ground at less cost with less, less inventory and being able to price those products in, in the gig economy, for example, to be able to um, create income for themselves and, and their communities. But do you see it uh, as a, something that's fairly scalable? I mean, right now, a lot of the use cases that I've seen have been like printing prosthetics, right? Like very niche businesses. And how do you make that kind of an integrated, scalable uh, product? So it's not just one person, instead of buying and selling things you know, in the market, they're printing things, but they're still selling in the market kind of perspective. Absolutely, and, and you know, individuals is one aspect, but of course, um, producers and companies is another aspect. Take, for instance, the automotive industry mm -hmm. um, in Nigeria, which is where I'm from originally. And so when you look at the automotive industry, there are, there's the opportunity to prototype products, to print those out locally um, that can be used in vehicles locally, as opposed to um, you know, dealing with the high expenses with import um, transportation and all the other, some of the other infrastructural challenges. And so being able to create these cost pools locally where local talent, um, human capital in this case, can, you know, use computer-aided design models, create what's needed in the industry, whether it's automobile industry or agriculture industry, and be able to basically manufacture on site sure. where before models would have to be built overseas and, and you know yeah. um, brought in we all of a sudden have local manufacturing that I, can happen. I think some of the interesting kind of broader industrial plays are happening in South Africa in particular there's a lot of exploration of looking at 
metal processing and taking the kind of uh, the metals that are already available from the mining industry and doing some refinement through robotics and 3D printing of the metals to make certain parts. So I think that's a very interesting application, um, but still early days for 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 most players. Um, the other issue on the, the 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 aspect that I think is very exciting for Africon 3D printing is there's going to need to be a lot of programming and software and services that serves the industry, even if the industry is here. And so, you know, can and Della's of the world provide those type of programmers, software developers, et cetera, uh, because some of that aspect of the production line of 3D printing could be done, that value chain in African markets. Absolutely, and that's where, you know, multi-stakeholder partnerships come sure. into play. So not just working, I, I represent civil society, but not just working in silo within civil society, but in close collaboration with government and the private sector. Of course, our educational system still needs to be um, you know, brought up to date, um, where science, technology, engineering, and math is a focal point um, for young people in the educational system, sure. and where they're able to you know, really gain that talent um, in the schools, in the secondary schools, for instance, so that they learn how to use computer-aided design and they learn how to not just get jobs, but actually create jobs using this technology. Sure, sure. So and I'm with that, I'm glad you brought up the talent piece, because uh, Chijoke, I mean, as an entrepreneur, and you've worked in different sectors, businesses, how is uh, finding talent is everyone's biggest problem as, a, as an, an entrepreneur. How has it been? Uh, how have you seen the kind of talent pools change? And do you think uh, Nigeria, Kenya, other places are you need to attract talent from in the world, or is it all local? Or how do you look at the talent equation for uh, innovative startups in African markets? So I was in a panel yesterday at uh, the FinTech yeah. Summit, and I think your colleague actually said one of the um, one of the biggest discussions on most portfolio companies is talent. You know, right. acquiring talent, you know, attracting talent as well. Um, you know, we run a, a digital finance um, platform uh, via an app, so we so. Data scientists, um, you know, software engineers are key to our business. Um, being based in Lagos, and you know, I think one of our challenges is to attract the right kinds of people, right talent. Um, most, this is a technology that hasn't really been done before in Africa. Um, so, so our competitors are in Germany, then San Francisco. So we don't have the talent av you know, available who actually know, um, you know, how to manipulate data. I mean, we're getting there. So we actually have. Um, lots of people learning now about data science, but it's still, it's still a challenge. So one of the things we've had to do is adopt flexible, um, you know, work patterns. So we have an office in Cape Town where we do hire a data scientists. Um, we've worked with data scientists in San Francisco. We have some data scientists in Nigeria as well, with, who, 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 you know, and then we, you know, so it's, it's a big challenge. It, it's probably... So you've woven like a global network yeah, of talent, basically. Yeah. It, it's probably... It's, in terms of like raising funds or getting talent, I think getting talent is actually our biggest challenge than raising funds. You know. And, and do you think the role, I mean, you have two investors on this uh, panel. Do you think investors could do more to help you attract the talent? So I, I think... You know, I, people I, always talk about smart capital, maybe like managing a fund plus an HR agency. No, or like. absolutely. <laughs> and I think, you know, for some, for some um, engineers, for instance, um, they actually are worried about the, the investors that are investing in your fund. So for instance, if you want to get you know, an amazing um, engineer from, let's say, San Francisco, you know, does, is a Silicon Valley investor invested in your company? You know, are they working for an, an AZ-16 um, portfolio company or a Sequoia company, or are they working for a company that is, um, you know, so they want some brand mitigation, risk mitigation uh, of going to work for a Lagos-based uh, startup. They yeah. want to know that it's got some brand resonance at home. Absolutely. Yeah, and and sometimes actually beyond brand because it's from from a talent pool perspective is about the, you know startups are risky, mm -hmm. so it's about visibility into okay this is my livelihood, if I join this startup are they going to be able to raise money down the road? So yeah. real hardcore talent actually cares about being compensated, and that's a that's that's well and, you can't, and yeah, obviously you can't. they're compensated yeah. in part in like yeah. you know equity, yeah, 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 so no, they care about their equity, equity being equity. able yeah, to yeah. to grow yeah. into that. Yeah. One thing I'll just add, just yeah. finally on talent is that I wouldn't. I agree. I think I'll agree a lot with what Joker said because, you know, portfolio companies in Africa a lot of time is about talent, both both uh, top management 
and also actually middle yeah. layer as well. And uh, we have a portfolio, and Dela is a portfolio of the IFC. So we will want to do more about just investing in like uh, companies that can create talent faster because the opportunity in Africa, in my view, is the demographic opportunity. Sure. It's the youngest continent. It's so transforming so humans uh, into, into productive, productive beings. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. But I, I totally agree. There's uh, so much challenge. I see so many kind of headhunting agencies yeah. operating at the CFO, CEO level. Yeah. But then if you ask them to recruit at the director or manager level, they're like, no, yeah. no yeah. not a chance. Middle right? management mm -hmm. is hard. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's there is a role that investors can play beyond capital and beyond the brand that they bring with their capital in terms of um, building leadership capabilities mm -hmm. for entrepreneurs, for senior managers, and then also for middle managers. They're like coaching, mentoring, those type of things? I think those are definitely initiatives that, that investors can look at. Even things like bringing their portfolios together and enabling, you know, knowledge sharing, learning, cross portfolio exchange of ideas. Um, being an entrepreneur is a tough job. It, um, it's a lonely job. It's a challenging thing. And so when you can create those communities, I think right. there's a lot of power in that. But it seems also, Jujuki, you're talking about like linking the, the ecosystems, right? You know, there are three major ecosystems for, for innovation on, in, in Africa, Kenya, Cape Town, and Lagos mm -hmm. and you're talking about like you already have kind of a Cape Town Lagos connection uh, and going back and forth um, do you think that there are enough efforts to leak the link the ecosystems or is it always kind of it's Kenya better than Nigeria kind of rivalries you know I think maybe four or five years ago there was that you know <laughs> Nairobi Lagos um, Cape Town um, competition but I, I don't think um, it's much of an issue anymore um, I, I think it's probably helped by the likes of Andela being, you know, being in Lagos, being in Nairobi, and mm -hmm. um, moving around. But I, I think that, um, you know, it's it's a struggle. So we shouldn't really be competing. We should <laughs> be work. We should be collaborating um, and together, definitely. Yeah. Right. And this conversation on human capital is not just relevant, of course, as we know in the startup world, but also for more mature yeah. Yeah, companies yeah, sure, as well. It, it continues to remain you know, a great challenge. And of course, um, you know, one of the identified reasons is this, the skills gap, right? Yep. The skills that employers are looking for versus the skills that are readily available in, in the marketplace. And, you know, there's a lot of finger pointing, right? The, the government says, well, the school should be providing this. The school says, well, the government should be providing this. And in the center are these young people that um, <laughs> are promised to, to some degree that if you get a good education, you land a good job, which is never the reality in a lot of these um, African countries that we work with. And we know that, you know, of, co of course, pride comes with completing education and getting a, a good job. And that's one of the, you know, the major risks, I guess, that we're really faced with. And, and it even gets more complicated when you look at the future of work. Um, because not only are the young people um, n not really sure where they stand in the future of work and what skills that they need, but the employers themselves also know that the future of work is going to add, you know, affect their business and how do they need to be better but, prepared but, but for that. But on the future of work, like, uh, you know, I've argued many times that the future of work in the United States can be best seen in African markets where we're going. Because if you look at all the growth to job growth in Nigeria, for example, mm. it's all been in the services sector. And services sector is one giant catch-all for the informal sector. Mm. And basically, the idea of side hustles and gig economy is alive and well all through African markets. Mm -hmm. And as we go to more kind of informal structures for work, where people are kind of cobbling together different uh, income streams, I think there's a lot to be learned by looking at that reality in emerging markets, because uh, people are already living that, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the future of work is actually a good topic and actually it goes back to education in my mind. I think we've lived through this like uh, centuries, of maybe the last hundred years where education was predicated on you getting a piece of paper that mm -hmm. you've done something. It was always certificate based, right? And I think in the future, it's going to be more about skills. What can you actually do with It's not really about, OK, I spent four years here. You give me a certificate and certified. It's more about what can you do that is productive and what skills do you actually yeah. get from so that? And I think that's a On that, I mean, there's a lot of companies out there thinking about using blockchain yeah. to verify um, people's skills, yeah. to verify their, their backgrounds. Yeah. You don't have these questions. Yeah. Uh, be kind of third party ledger approach to, yeah. to skills. And then, of course, on EdTech, um, you know, there's Tunji and, and Giddy Mobile are trying to gamify uh, the learning phase. So, I mean, I assume you can be investing in that exact trend. Yeah, yeah. And I think beyond that, there's a really important link between 
financial inclusion and um, you know the future of work and employment because the engines of employment in most of the markets that we're talking about are small businesses. Sure. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest barriers to small business growth is a lack of access to capital. Sure. And so what we can do to put into place better access to financing for small businesses actually drives employment. Sure, and Shadoki, that's a market you've gone after. So maybe you want to give some examples of OneFi working for, you know, providing credit to, to individuals and to, to small businesses. Sure. I mean, um, so we you know, we provide anywhere from you know twenty dollars to three thousand uh, dollars to consumers uh, and small businesses via uh, an Android app. Um, one of the things we also do, or we we have done. And how many users do you have? Just to give people get a sure. sense of the scale so we, of your business. So we have um, eight hundred thousand, about eight hundred thousand users, of which one hundred thirty thousand have an active active loan. A quarter of a million are active on a monthly basis. Um, we do about $3 million a month in uh, loan disbursements, um, all um, fully automated. Um, you know, we also did, one of the things we also did was look at transaction data from small businesses um, based on their POS transactions and actually lend against that. Mm -hmm. um, and we were able to deploy capital, you know, within 24 hours to, to small businesses that were, that would not have access to capital um, via bank because in Nigeria, and in, at least certainly in West Africa, you would need collateral sometimes, you know, anywhere as high as 50%. Um, you know, you, it would take about two months to, to, to actually get the loan. So it's, it's one of the things we've been able to um, sort of fast track um, by. And do by you notice in the data the, how people are using it is for the business users? Is it trade finance? Are they using it to kind of buy and sell? Yeah, it's, it's working capital. Working capital. Pure working capital. Yep. And in Ghana, when we started, you'd have a situation where people would actually borrow money from us and then they would also repay, repay back the same deal the next day. Even though it's a one-month loan, they would actually just pay back in two days and then up reapply again. So, so I mean, you're, you're, you're operating in the function of a, a bank's traditional rotating letter of credit. Yeah, definitely. And when you look at that um, finance technology of fintech and um, relate that to the small and growing business segment, take back to 3D printing again, um, basic consumables, household <coughs> consumables that people can model and, and actually print out. Um, the barriers to entry are extremely low mm -hmm. uh, for you know any any small and growing business entrepreneur. They have less inventory is needed, um, and they are able to you know come up with a prototype, say on Monday, and by Friday that prototype is in market. Um, you know, having access to working capital like what Chidi Oke described. So there is really um, tremendous opportunity in the SGB segment to use these types of emerging technologies to access the global marketplace. Yes. And, and coming back, Chidi what are your constraints to growth? I mean, what would it take for you guys to do $10 million a month to get your user base at, you know, $4 million? What What's yeah. the next kind of hump to get to that level? So capital. <laughs> um, capital, talent, um, to grow the team. Um, I think also regulatory certainty, because I think that's one of the challenges as well in, in fintech is, you know, a lot of the regulators are unsure and certain, you know, about, you know, the way forward. So things like blockchain, uh, you know, fintech should, should, should lend us like, I mean, we're regulated in Nigeria. Um, but I know that in, in, in certain countries, you don't have to be regulated or, or the regulator is silent on, on that. So it's, you know, for investors to come in, one of the questions they ask is, are you regulated? You know, what does the regulator feel um, about what you're doing? What do the banks feel? feel? Do the banks feel comfortable, yeah. et cetera? And so the regulation I, I think, definitely impacts yeah. your trajectory, right? For, yeah. It's one thing for you to be regulated as lending, yeah. credit. But then if you go tell central bank CBN of, of, of Nigeria that you're going to start taking deposits or yeah. doing savings, then they're going to start saying, OK, then you're maybe a different entity. Exactly. And so you have to, your, your growth trajectory, because it seems to me a lot of in games for a lot of the fintech players are digital banks. Yeah. They want to functionally become a digital bank. But then now you're talking a different level of regulatory yeah. engagement. And I, but I, I don't think regulation is wrong. No. I, I think if you're, if you're going to be a digital bank, you should get regulated. Sure. Um, but I, I think it's, um, I think that uncertainty is, is actually what, what sort of stifles funding coming to, coming to the sector. Sure. Yeah. And on the funding side, we had a little bit of a discussion uh, prior to the panel uh, where the money is coming from and what that money looks like. 
Uh, we said earlier that um, you know having Silicon Valley and having big brands helps you attract the talent, but there might be some downsides to taking Silicon Valley money. And so maybe Terry, you can speak on, yeah. on that view and then we can kind of discuss it as a whole. Well, I mean, I think what's important is having investors that are aligned and aligned in a number of ways, right? So understanding the realities of operating in the markets that you operate, aligned visions for growth. Um, and, and so, you know, I think there, we are starting to see more foreign capital moving into Africa. And, and I think that is on the whole a good thing. But when you bring in investors from Silicon Valley that are used to a specific type of growth, that are used to investing in consumer businesses where they're worried more about the number of users than they are a sustainable revenue model, for example, and are looking for a certain speed of growth and are expecting to get money back through an IPO in a few years, that doesn't necessarily translate well into the African context. And that can result in pressures for growth, that are not sustainable, that are not good for the startups. And if it doesn't succeed, can then result in a withdrawal of capital. Um, and you know, Jyoga, you mentioned the importance of capital for growth. And I think equity capital is critical, but especially if you're a lending business, getting access to wholesale debt, to on-lending capital uh, is really critical. And ideally you want that capital locally mm -hmm. um, because you, you, know, you don't want to be bearing the forex risk on it and the volumes of capital that you need are significant. Uh, and so really thinking about how you can find the right kind of local capital or at least aligned investors to be able to support your businesses is really critical. It seems finding that like right mix because you know, so much of business is psychology and, and you know, behavioral economics that, you know, having the, the large names in, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how, how helpful was, you know, Zuckerberg's money into Andela? Well, the money itself, but the name and the signal that gave to the rest of the world. So we are like in a branded yeah. signaling Absolutely. world. But the, uh, you know, the focus on exit, the focus on outside pressure, versus local debt. I mean, clearly, almost every every entrepreneur I know comes to the equity conversation because by default they wanted debt first, right? Yeah. So debt, the availability of local debt is a huge, huge issue. And actually, the availability of local equity is actually, in my view, uh, a bigger issue because uh, the, the, the frank conversation is that local equity is in Africa, we need to do more. It's non-existent. Uh, is it though? I mean, I feel like in Nigeria, Nigeria is a special case, yeah, right? Yeah. Because there is so much friends and family money, at least for elite entrepreneurs that have access. Yeah. When you're in Ghana, you're in other countries, they don't have the ability to go to kind of well off of how many worth individuals and get the million. I feel like people can raise a million dollars of seed money in Nigeria. The, 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 the issue we see is not that there's a lack of local money, is that the local money does not understand technology or innovation. Uh, most of the local money made their money from trade yes. and, and made industries. So it's very hard for them when you come and pitch them some opportunity where they're, they're going to give you money with seven years or when they can just buy treasury bills and make 21% in a year, guaranteed. So, so, so from, from a kind of a local perspective about, yes, some of these countries actually have money, but, but do the rich people, the people that will be angel investors, do they actually understand tech? I would say it's less than 5%. And it's not their fault, they just don't understand the asset class. Sure. So, 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 so what I always, people always say about, you know, Silicon Valley money, money coming into Africa. My view is just like if I was a founder, I wouldn't really care about what the color of my money is, as long as it's green, green or maybe, you know, orange if it's coming from China. Mm -hmm. but, 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 but ultimately, the bigger issue is that it's a founder investor conversation, is that once you take money from a VC or a P, you need to understand what the expectations are. And if the expectations match yours, get their money. If the expectations, expectations are divergent from yours, maybe you shouldn't take their money. But it's a conversation I always encourage founders to have. Okay, this is money, but money coming in has expectations. Mm -hmm. And if you can meet the expectations, fine. If you cannot, maybe that's not the best capital for you. But I wouldn't say one form of capital is better than but another. But not just expectations. Yeah. I mean, you got to understand how much of your company you're going to own after these yeah, rounds. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've known of a lot of founders yeah. who've raised yeah. kind of mini rounds yeah. and using different flexible mechanisms yeah. and suddenly do the math on the equity <laughs> they still hold yeah. and yeah. it's not as pretty as it uh, <laughs> once was. Yeah. But I, I think the challenge, to Terry's point, is, you know, I mean, a lot of 
people, a lot of startups in Africa, we, we look to Silicon Valley and the Google and Facebook. So it's like grow and it, it will come. So you're going to a local equity investor and you're telling her that, you know, I'm going to burn cash for the next five years and then someone's going to rescue me <laughs> as opposed to um, I'm, this is how I'm going to get profitable in the next couple of months. Mm -hmm. So, so I think there's also that that issue is that we're you know we're sort of I won't say corrupted that's a strong word, but I, I think you know you, you'd have people have these crazy Silicon Valley valuations in Lagos. Oh, my company's worth ten million dollars. I have no revenues. I have no customers. But it's, I, you know, I was on TechCrunch the other day and I saw something similar and they have twenty million. So I think with local equity investors, they they need to know how you know because they made their money in trade. So you know you, you go to work. You sell something, you make money, you use that to buy more, etc. Yeah, sure. And I think a lot of us in in the startup world, we have this, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna have a million, two million users, and somehow we're gonna monetize them when we get there. It, it doesn't work with a local equity investor. You know, you you actually need to, you know. And doesn't Silicon Money uh, Valley money kind of go to a particular kind of founder too? I mean, isn't that part of uh, the kind of question about that money? I yeah. mean, it's gonna go to people they know. Right. And people they know probably spent time living there. I mean, I'm, yeah. while, while I was living yeah. in Silicon Valley, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of that money also goes to men founders, yeah. Yeah. men, um, white, as opposed to female foreigner, founders, yeah. right? Where the returns yeah. on on female companies uh, have, of course, historically been sure. been greater. And so there's that um, mm -hmm. diversity component of things as well. I mean, just uh, on top of Wally's point around uh, meeting investor expectations. Um, I wouldn't put all the pressure necessarily on the startup itself. Um, of course, they have majority of the pressure, but the question also is what strategic partnerships have they developed or do they intend to develop that um, will bring to bear a lot of the successes that the VCs expect as well. Mm -hmm. I think that the question about strategic, in, strategic partnerships is, is a critical one because a lot of startups want to or tend to do everything alone. Mm -hmm. And um, that should not necessarily be the case to attract I've capital. seen some success in that area as well, too, where um, Nigerian companies in particular, some of which I work closely with, have reached out to US corporates on like a business partnership or sourcing, say, for batteries, mm -hmm. for example. And then in that dialogue, the corporate will do a corporate venture, will actually invest alongside, and yeah. they're much more of a strategic investor because they're in a similar mm -hmm. business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was not the intent of the conversation to begin with, but mm -hmm. there is access to, to corporate venture in the US in a way that's not yet mm -hmm. happened in African markets. Well, one thing I'll add to that is that most good investors, uh, when they come on the cap table and invest in a company, they understand that they want to add some sort of value beyond the capital. And the yeah. reason they chose that company is because they have value add to add, whether that's a Rolodex, whether they understand the space, whether they can help with talent. So most investors think, whether they're corporates or not, about, okay, how can we help this, uh, this company actually grow? Because they're, uh, they're part owners now. So I'm not saying all investors are good investors, but you need to know that most top-tier VCs, whether they're Silicon Valley, Chinese, African, will try to add value to their portfolio companies. But the question is the, the, the way they add value and the, the, the thing they think need to be added are those matching to what yeah. the, the we'll entrepreneur needs, yeah. right? Yeah. Because there aren't many venture funds that I know of that can immediately go in and help the the, the portfolio company source local debt, which is what they really need, yeah. right? Yeah. And if you're sitting in the yeah. valley, can yeah. you help them source local debt? Uh, no. uh, you know, that's the, that's the question, I think. And maybe we can speak a little bit to the question around foreign founders. It's been such a big controversy <laughs> within the African tech space uh, about the question of whether Foreign founders get not only more money from from uh, venture capitalists, but also higher valuations. You want me to take that? Uh, I want anyone I thought to I was just defending San Francisco. Like, <laughs> defend them anyway. no, I think I think we hear that conversation a lot about just foreign founders getting uh, more funding. I have my personal views about it. And just that I think we tend to see that more in the early stage than in the later stage of things. Uh, within the IFC, we kind of deal, our min minimum ticket size is three million and above, so we don't really see that in any way. But, but we see more Why, of that. Why, because all those companies died? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> just because at the scale where we invest, uh, at some point, the, where the founder is from doesn't really matter. It's more about are they a good founder? This company is big enough kind of scale. So it's not like a conversation we actually have actively. But, but, but in the early stage side of things, particularly like in East Africa, uh, because when you're an early stage company, your ability to raise money is, is correlated to the networks you have, mm -hmm. just fundamentally that is. Uh, fundamentally, if you went to an Ivy League school, whether you're foreign or not, you, know, you, you, you kind of have more, a larger network. 
ergo you can raise money faster. Yeah. And that's kind of what the, I think that, in my view, that's what the crux of the situation is, is that if you already have a big Rolodex, you have a network, you can actually raise 500K quite easily. If you don't, and you're kind of a local founder, you don't have a network, and the local guy wants you to get profitability in two weeks, it, you probably won't get money. But, but if you have a bigger network, then it's easier to, 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 to raise money. But having said that, I think there's a lot that has to be done around diversity, create, creating access, getting more people to have money. But, but I just see the dynamics more, it's more around the, the size of individual networks versus like some bigger skin there. But Do you I, think I, you, I, both well, of you guys have <laughs> got uh, but, uh, but I mean, you, so, you're, so the danger is that you're looking at foreign founder versus a local, and, and the, local has, the local founder has no networks. Well, you also have you have repads. Uh, yeah, you have repads who are also in the same networks, yeah. um, and then but they just don't get access. Your brothers and living in San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, they, they just don't get access. In I mean, <laughs> the, you know, the way I look at it is, I remember when I was in university in um, the UK, and we, we, there was a recruitment, and you know, uh, recruitment, you know, fairs, and so we asked, um, I think it was Goldman Sachs. So you know, what, what are you looking for in students in, in your recruit? And they were like, we want people who, you know built villages in Africa, and, we all, and a few of the Africans were like, well, why? We, we live there. You know, <laughs> like, so, so it's like you're getting brownie points for yeah. doing something where we come from there anyway. Yeah, so yeah, it, yeah. It's, and, and I think that that's the challenge, is that it, it's too simplistic to say that the, the foreign founders have better networks, because some local founders have just as you know, good networks or even superior networks to, to foreign founders, both in, in the countries and also in the countries they're, in, they're investing in. Um, I, look, I, I just think it's maybe... Um, I don't know what it is. There's so many things have been written bias. about it. <laughs> well, so it's I think bias, we're but kidding but ourselves so if we say bias doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right? The it data does. shows yeah. it. Bias yeah. exists. Yeah. Implicit bias exists. Yeah. Whether or not we're aware of it, as investors, those things exist. We are drawn to people who are more like us. Yeah, right. I think awareness exactly. is really critical. Yeah. The more we have these conversations, yeah. Yeah. and I think it's critical for investors to be able to have the conversations. I also think you need more diversity on the investor side. Oh, yeah. Totally. Because, you know, again, if people are more like to, likely to invest in people like themselves, if you have more diverse investor teams and investor teams that draw more on local talent, you start to get past that, right? And you have a very diverse team at Axion. We do. I mean, you we're, have a lot of women. You have. We're. we're oh. I mean, it's something that we're conscious about. But you know, it's it, it, and and yet, you know, if you look at the data, even from venture in the U.S., right, seven percent of women of, of uh, venture capital professionals in the U.S. are women. And having more women at the top of venture funds means that you're more likely to have women in the funds. Yeah. So starting, you know, women and women in leadership positions helps. But the data from the U.S. at least shows that women aren't necessarily, even in venture funds, more likely to invest in more female founders. Yeah. So e those implicit biases run deep. And we have to be aware of them. We have to talk about them. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way we'll start getting past that. Um, and, you know, and I think for investors starting to be clearer about what is it that we're looking for. When we say pattern recognition, when we say, you know, the gut feel, what does that actually mean? Yeah. Let's actually enumerate those criteria. Let's look at them. Let's talk about them. And we are starting to see advances and even use of technology in the venture industry itself where you're starting to see things like, you know, venture funds using machine learning and algorithms to actually start to say, what are the characteristics of businesses that succeed? And those can start to pull out certain biases as well. Yeah. So awareness conversations and, and, and really breaking down those characteristics is critical. And, and it's, a, it's, a good, uh, it's a good conversation to, to have. And I think well, two things I actually wanted to touch on and bring it in, uh, directly to Africa is that what we've seen is that the, the most challenged group of people are actually founders, not repats, not for you, founders that were born in Africa, and stayed. that stayed and have never yeah. left. Yeah. 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 That's, that's kind of the, the ones that are is quite difficult. I have a great to, story of that, get, of that one, one yeah. because you know, you know yeah. this company Printivo mm -hmm. in, in Lagos? Yeah. So yeah. We, meet, we meet with a founder, I bring a very well-known yeah. venture capitalist kind of yeah. paragon to, yeah. to Nigeria, yeah. and we're in his office, and he's, he did an online printing company like Moo.com, if you guys know Moo. And so he's showing us his first printer he bought off of eBay. And he brought the printer to, to Lagos. And you know, this very senior venture capitalist says, well, um, <clears throat> did you have like friends and family money to help you buy this? Did you get it while you were abroad? He's yeah. like, no, 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 I just saved money. 
I just worked to save money. Yeah. He's like, but where did you study? He's like, no, no, Lagos. I'm here. Like, all the questions assumed that there was kind of not only a repat story behind it, but also like very high connected friends and family yeah. money. Yeah. Right. Where he's like, no, no, no. I just worked an extra job and then I bought the first copier. Yeah. And yeah. the story was much more localized, but it was yeah. a surprise story yeah. in that scenario. Yeah. But but that's where the authenticity comes yeah. in, right? And yeah. that's where everything around that story surpasses, in my humble opinion, even those networks. Mm -hmm. So it's about what is the founder's vision? Yeah. And is that founder in the best position based on his or her experience to address solutions to what that vision is? And, right. and that is where, you know, when I see founders, I go back to what is, what is their fundamental vision? And are right. they the best person to solve whatever that issue is? And based on their personal story. Well, in Yomi's and, case, he's super passionate about right. Printivo. Right, and then yeah, the yeah, guy probably wears like Printivo like uh, underwear. I mean, the guy <laughs> like, that's passionate on his, yeah, yeah, yeah. his startup. It's all about. That. I, I do want to take some questions from the audience, so I'll take a group of them, and then we'll come back and kind of weave it in. So we've got three here. We'll take these four. Please introduce yourself and your question. Got the mics coming around. My name is Walter Jurassic. I see the panel over here. I'm sure that you parents invested in you heavily to be here over here and have a nice conversation. So my question, what the percentage of businesses are investing in the kids and the future? Okay. And I give you an example. Look at this East European country, even my native country of Poland. They give it a lot of money for investments on education. Now you see how the investments are coming to Poland because the workforce development is so rich. Mm -hmm. And in Africa, if they want to get anything going on and to build the middle class, which is the most important. Without middle class, I don't think that yeah. country mm -hmm. can prosper. So the question, so the question is what the is the generation. percentage? What is the percentage on you investment on education? Sure. Okay. We'll take that one. Education next generation. Okay, so my name is Beverly Allen, and Mr. Ayane, I'd like to hear the rest of your point yeah. on founders who remain in, in their home countries in Africa. Yeah. Okay. And we had, a, we had one right here. I'll take her. Hi, my name is Hannah Wetters. Um, I'm wondering if you can all speak to how to include the startup community into a conversation about the government and where future regulation is going. Okay. And then we'll take... Ambassador in the back. I'm Bob Perry with the Stevenson Group. Uh, given the difficulty sometime of raising capital from individual people of high net worth, what is your experience with crowdfunding, mm -hmm. either in country or from the diaspora in Europe and the US, which may have more funds available? Sure. And we had one more over here. Hank. Uh, Herman Cohen, former State Department. Uh, Ms. Dosani, you mentioned the f funding of uh, Kenya farmers. Mm -hmm. Is there an issue with land tenure? Okay, so we got a couple questions to get us through this next conversation round. Maybe we start with you and, and while I'm telling the story more on, on local, far local founders who stay. I mean, the yeah, non-elite so, so, uh, the, 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 the non elite uh, and the, the second thought that I have is just more of, more of like a kind of an academic conversation we, we, we have internally is that a lot of people want to come to Africa and the conversation is always about can you risk my investment so that I can get into Africa and then the question we always ask is that is that the right question to ask uh, why should we de-risk you to get into Africa maybe the better question is for us to identify people that understand the risk in Africa and back those people and, and figuring out, you know, how you actually do that effectively, it's it's kind of an, it's kind of a conversation we have it. And then to the the, the, the question about education, uh, so I'll, I'm I'm in the VC group, so we do education tech. But the IFC has a big education practice in Africa. Uh, we have programs around K-12 education, university education, brick and mortar building. But it's a different group. It's an education group that does that. They've deployed billions in Africa. Uh, we totally understand that, that the future of Africa, like I said before, is the demographic. Uh, about 50% about of the population growth in the next 20 years is going to come from Africa. My view is that Africa is the future of the world. So you can't just leave young people with no education and no skills. So we, we really think that education is one of kind of a pivotal role. Maybe not 
totally within the VC group, but as a holistic view in the IFC. And okay. I, I also took this question from a personal note, yeah. probably from mm -hmm. for you and Chijoke. Yeah. What do you, are you doing for the next generation? Um, I'm sure oh, you personally. Yeah, exactly. Oh. <laughs> like I'm sure there's a lot, right? <laughs> my, you have my, my, my inbox is full every day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Helping people go to school, yeah, yeah. start businesses, yeah. etc. I know yeah. that in in Lagos there is kind of a small angel club yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. of founders. Yeah. Um, and and Chidok, maybe you can speak to that because I know you and your brothers have have invested in startups as well. Yes, I mean, so we've we've invested in startups um, both in Nigeria and also in in Kenya um, in the past. Um, in terms of education, also because one of our biggest challenges is is talent. We and um, the lack of talent, especially in, in our field. Um, we have just completed a pilot where we've been sponsoring students in the east of Nigeria to um, on data science courses. Um, and the whole idea is that you know they, they they get the skills, the theoretical skills, and then we actually you know let you know employ them to work for us on, on some of our um, on some of our data sets. Um, so yeah, education is is, is extremely um, important for us. Um, yeah. And I'll just add to that point, uh, you know, the work Youth for Technology Foundation has done over the last 17 years, starting in Nigeria first and then expanding to Kenya and Uganda, is all in the corridors of education and entrepreneurship. So yeah. when you think of, you know, the future of work, where the young people stand in that, um, irrespective of automation, right? Data shows us, research shows us by, by 2040, you know, 50% of the jobs will be automated. But that does not mean we don't need people necessarily. We need highly skilled talent. And so the education sector has an opportunity to ensure that our young people are prepared for that. And that's really what our focus is at, at Youth for Technology Foundation, working with the ministries of education, working with private sector to ensure that once the young people have the training, they then have the positions to roll into. And then doing a little bit of even changing the cultural and societal mindsets that entrepreneurship is indeed a career. And just like a young person wants to go into teaching or wants to go into you know, med medicine or, or uh, the legal profession, also being an entrepreneur is a viable career and that's an option that can be looked at, but only if you have the right education. And yeah. so that is what our work involves. So maybe we can turn to the question of crowdfunding um, and maybe on that ICOs um, because they are a form of, of crowd financing to some extent. So I have no experience with ICOs. Yeah. Um, I, know, I know a couple of Nigerian companies have actually been successful in raising money from ICOs. In one of our portfolio companies, we, um, we, used, we, we tried to use crowdfunding to raise money for a, um, a, an investment we had in coffee. Uh, and that didn't work because the, the actual network, there wasn't a big sort of network, so the, the platform was new. Um, we got lots of questions, and there were lots of investors' interest from Germany, from Europe, but it wasn't successful. Um, and also, I think even in Nigeria, crowdfunding is, um, the SEC has taken a view um, that you know, crowdfunding is not really to be, to be looked at yet. So I think that, that the regulator has a part to play in, in making it um, available or, or accessible to people. And uh, Tahir, maybe you can talk about yeah. the ag tech and land tenure if you're doing uh, insuring farmers, what if they don't own their land and, and that must be a risk? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, and, and I think I agree on the, the ICO and the crowdfunding point. I mean, yeah. one, I think the lack of regulation around it does make it pretty murky and challenging on ICOs in particular. Secondly, I think crowdfunding can be a viable option, especially in the early stages. We've seen companies kind of do small crowdfunding campaigns, but again, you know, having a network to kind of promote and publicize that is relevant. And if you're not tapped into the, the investor networks or high net worth networks, it's hard to really get traction there. Uh, and it, it's usually, you know, hard to, especially for businesses that aren't consumer facing where, you know, it isn't kind of a mass market appeal. It's tough to get crowdfunding going. Yeah. Um, on the, the, the question about, ag you know, Land rights are, are absolutely an issue, and, and the lack of kind of good land registries in a lot of these markets um, it definitely persists as a challenge. I think that's a place where blockchain technology can be leveraged to um, build better registries and, and kind of enable better data around land rights and securing those in the future. Where Apollo is working in Kenya right now, that hasn't been a major issue. Um, they're also not 
doing something like you know mortgaging land sales or things like that where ownership of the land is as critical they're making loans of roughly $150 you know to uh, of seed and fertilizer to farm the land and these are really smallholder farmers so that's been less of an issue for this company directly but that is a huge issue in financial inclusion broadly especially as you look at things like mortgage finance and we have um, I want to make sure we, we touch on Hannah's question about interaction with the regulator um, I certainly know that, that that happens in Nigeria. There is interaction. I don't know if, if, if investors interact with regulators that often and that dialogue. So maybe you guys can speak to what interaction with regulators has been like across markets. Sure. You know, I'll start and then Molly, please jump in. But we, we definitely do have relationships with key regulators um, in the markets that we're in, and I think it's important to be part of that dialogue. Uh, we also really encourage our portfolio companies to do that, to be part of those conversations. So because um, as Chijokwe said, regulation is either existent, uh, non-existent or very nascent, especially when it comes to new technology. And so being part of the conversation with the regulator means that we or our companies can help influence that. And they can, they, you know, regulation is built around that. And regulators do have a tough job because they're trying to balance protection of the markets and of the consumers along with still being enabling for technology. Sure. And they're trying to see, you know, financial inclusion as a public good. Yeah. Absolutely. And the but motivation is yeah. a public good, but then you have Manage companies the risk. That, yeah. that have to make money. Yeah. So Absolutely. that's a tension sometimes. Yeah, I mean, we have conversations with regulators, uh, with IFC, so we have access to them, right? <laughs> but but the, the, uh, the, I think, I totally agree with you, is that, which I actually find encouraging, is that uh, startups need to be part of the conversation, and a lot of markets, they are not, even in the U.S., a lot of times they are not. Oh. So, so I'll say that in that particular realm, a lot of African countries are actually uh, ahead, ahead where, where conversations with, with, with startups actually happen. So. Sure. Okay, we're going to take a round of maybe a couple more questions and then close up right here. Hi there, I'm, my name is Dave Buffalo. I, uh, I did a lot of work in Zambia and working with the government and also with business, uh, some big business owners there. One of the problems I saw that it's an opportunity for fintech that I just wanted to, to look in the agriculture sector. Um, farmers in Zambia are unable to get working capital. The only traditional lending mechanism is to mortgage their farm, yeah. which it takes by the time they get the money, you know, oftentimes they only need two or th you know three to six weeks operating capital, as as you've mentioned, um, and they were unable to use the crop or the yield as their as their collateral. collateral. Is this? It seems like the easy solution is something in fintech. I don't know the answer, or is it a question of is that unique to Zambia? More mature economies like like um, uh, Nigeria don't have these issues. Is it something that is a question of? getting the fintech to also engage in policy, as you mentioned, or, or uh, I, I would just like to uh, sure. hear and your do we thoughts have on Any that. other questions? OK, oh, right back here. Uh, Mid-level manufacturing. Uh, China okay. still, uh, Dick America, Georgetown University, uh, imports furniture and kitchen utensils and small uh, garden equipment, rakes, hoes, farms, wheelbarrows. That ought to be all, or almost all, manufactured in country, no more need to import that kind of uh, commonly used item. Uh, what's your observation on uh, the growth of that manufacturing sector? Okay. Light manufacturing. Excellent. Um, so with those two questions, we'll, we'll wrap up. Uh, thoughts on um, agriculture credit? Yeah. Uh, Chijoke, maybe you can chime in on, have you guys been lending and, and doing credit to farmers? And then uh, to hear maybe what you've yeah. invested in in that space? Yeah. Um, no, so we haven't done, well, we haven't formally done any lending to farmers. I mean, we might have <coughs> farmers who are our yeah, clients. You know. um, but you know, one of the things we've seen um, in Rwanda, for instance, where we had an investment in a coffee business was we actually um, got root capital, I think they have the base in Boston and um, DC to actually um, fund farmers based on their receivables. Um, so that, that 
Um, so, but that was coffee, and the you know, coffee is an international. Um, and it assumes crop. you have a credit-worthy yeah. uh, off-taker or buyer. And, yeah. Whereas exactly. if you're just bringing your farm, your your produce to market, and you're just selling it yeah. in the for market, for smallholder farmers, small, yeah. that's really tough. Mm. No, we, we we it's not something that's unique to Zambia yeah. by any means. It's something that really persists across the continent and 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 beyond. Um, and, and we are, you know, really interested in smallholder fin farmer finance. It's something that, you know, we're seeing good solutions now starting to think about working capital input finance for smallholder farmers. Definitely, you know, if you can work as part of supply chains, thinking about how you can leverage that data, you know, whether it's uh, or, or just looking at crop patterns. So, you know, Apollo is right now working with maize farmers, um, but they are hoping to start to expand to other sets of crops. And so we are we are starting to see fintech solutions. Um, you know, it's tough because there isn't collateral that can be used and there isn't a history of digitized data that exists that it's easy for a fintech to leverage today. So then it's, you know, how can you create that data at the point of transaction? Is there psychometric data you can use? Is there behavioral data that you can use? Is there other kind of satellite data or other types of data you can use? And, and I think the answer is yes. And it's it's still nascent, but it's growing today. And the I think blending it with add, insurance is very key yeah. too, Absolutely. because crop insurance, I mean, that's yeah. a huge mm -hmm. deal. The one thing I'll add just to answer your question and the person that asked about crowdfunding is there are two examples of companies that are doing this quite well in Nigeria. One is called Triver Greek, and the other one is called Farm Crowdy. They have a website where any individual can actually sponsor a farm. You look at what they're growing, and then once you give them the money, they use the money not to the farmer, but they use the money to buy inputs, whether that's fertilizer, whether that's seed. And once the farm, after yields, they actually take the result and sell it to an off-taker. So they're trying to provide a holistic 360 solution for smallholder farmers. So they're young people trying to think about how do you increase kind of the yields from, from, from farms. So, yeah. And their local, and their local founders. Called, uh, and their local founders. And their local founders. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Specifically in Nigeria, there's mm. also a Hello Tractor, which yeah. is yeah. kind of the Uber version of, of um, you know, the tractor. So I maybe, Njeka, in, in you can speak to the question of like, you know, on these goods that are currently imported from China and not yet manufactured in bulk, is that an opportunity for 3D printing to kind of offset the, the import bill? Uh, yes, absolutely. In terms of the democratization of innovation and the ability to take products, whatever products, whether it's, you know, I mean, you mentioned like a, a hose and, you know, light furniture, etc. But take those products and actually create and design what you envision for the products and being able to use emerging technologies to, you know, create, print out those products. I mean, 3D printing has grown dramatically you know, over the last couple of years, I mean, by 2025, it's going to be a significant $30 billion industry, right? Um, there's still cost implications with, with the equipment, but we've seen this, the cost of, of 3D printers come down dramatically at the consumer end, and there's still opportunities at the consumer and the business end, and there's still opportunities there. So I think the ability to have access to that technology and really to really make anything is is there and it's huge and and it's an ability that people and companies are starting to see more a little you know see more of and and implement more of as well so with that uh, join me in thanking the panel thank you ambassador for making the time of their schedule this week thank you thanks thank you. thanks everybody